chapter nine of the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe let every man mind his own business and so you will not sign this paper said alfred melton to his cousin a fine-looking young man who was lounging by the centre table not i indeed what in life have i to do with these decidedly vulgar temperance pledges pshaw they have a relish of whisky in their very essence come come cousin melton said a brilliant dark-eyed girl who had been lolling on the sofa during the conference i beg of you to give over attempting to evangelize edward you see as falstaff has it he is little better than one of the wicked you must not waste such valuable temperance documents on him but seriously melton my good fellow resumed edward this signing and sealing and pledging is altogether an unnecessary affair for me my past and present habits my situation in life in short everything that can be mentioned with regard to me goes against the supposition of my ever becoming the slave of a vice so debasing and this pledging myself to avoid it is something altogether needless nay by implication it is degrading as to what you say of my influence i am inclined to the opinion that if every man will look to himself every man will be looked to this modern notion of tacking the whole responsibility of society on to every individual is one i am not at all inclined to adopt for first i know it is a troublesome doctrine and secondly i doubt if it be a true one for both which reasons i shall decline extending to it my patronage well positively exclaimed the lady you gentlemen have the gift of continuance in an uncommon degree you have discussed this matter backward and forward till i am ready to perish i will take the matter in hand myself and sign a temperance pledge for edward and see that he gets into none of those naughty courses upon which you have been so pathetic i dare say said melton glancing on her brilliant face with evident admiration that you will be the best temperance pledge he could have but every man cousin may not be so fortunate but melton said edward seeing my steady habits are so well provided for you must carry your logic and eloquence to some poor fellow less favoured and thus the conference ended what a good disinterested fellow melton is said edward after he had left yes good as the day is long said augusta but rather prosy after all this tiresome temperance business one never hears the end of it nowadays temperance papers temperance tracts temperance hotels temperance this that and the other thing even down to temperance pocket handkerchiefs for little boys really the world is getting intemperately temperate ah oh, well with the security you have offered augusta i shall dread no temptation though there was nothing peculiar in these words yet there was a certain earnestness of tone that called the colour into the face of augusta and set her to sewing with uncommon assiduity and thereupon edward proceeded with some remark about guardian angels together with many other things of the kind which though they contain no more that is new than a temperance lecture always seem to have a peculiar freshness to people in certain circumstances in fact before the hour was at an end edward and augusta had forgotten where they began and had wandered far into that land of anticipations and bright dreams which surrounds the young and loving before they eat of the tree of experience and gain the fatal knowledge of good and evil but here stopping our sketching pencil let us throw in a little background and perspective that will enable our readers to perceive more readily the entire picture edward howard was a young man whose brilliant talents and captivating manners had placed him first in the society in which he moved 
though without property or weight of family connections he had become a leader in the circles where these appendages are most considered and there were none of their immunities and privileges that were not freely at his disposal augusta elmore was conspicuous in all that lies within the sphere of feminine attainment she was an orphan and accustomed from a very early age to the free enjoyment and control of an independent property this circumstance doubtless added to the magic of her personal graces in procuring for her that flattering deference which beauty and wealth secure her mental powers were naturally superior although from want of motive they had received no development except such as would secure success in society native good sense with great strength of feeling and independence of mind had saved her from becoming heartless and frivolous she was better fitted to lead and to influence than to be influenced or led and hence though not swayed by any habitual sense of moral responsibility the tone of her character seemed altogether more elevated than the average of fashionable society general expectation had united the destiny of the two persons who seemed every way fitted for each other and for once general expectation did not err a few months after the interview mentioned were witnessed the festivities and congratulations of their brilliant and happy marriage never did two young persons commence life under happier auspices what an exact match what a beautiful couple said all the gossips they seem made for each other said every one and so thought the happy lovers themselves love which with persons of strong character is always an earnest and sobering principle had made them thoughtful and considerate and as they looked forward to future life and talked of the days before them their plans and ideas were as rational as any plans can be when formed entirely with reference to this life without any regard to another for a while their absorbing attachment to each other tended to withdraw them from the temptations and allurements of company and many a long winter evening passed delightfully in the elegant quietude of home as they read and sang and talked of the past and dreamed of the future in each other's society but contradictory as it may appear to the theory of the sentimentalist it is nevertheless a fact that two persons cannot always find sufficient excitement in talking to each other merely and this is especially true of those to whom high excitement has been a necessary of life after a while the young couple though loving each other none the less began to respond to the many calls which invited them again into society and the pride they felt in each other added zest to the pleasures of their return as the gaze of admiration followed the graceful motions of the beautiful wife and the whispered tribute went round the circle whenever she entered edward felt a pride beyond all that flattery addressed to himself had ever excited and augusta when told of the convivial talents and powers of entertainment which distinguished her husband could not resist the temptation of urging him into society even oftener than his own wishes would have led him alas neither of them knew the perils of constant excitement nor supposed that in thus alienating themselves from the pure and simple pleasures of home they were risking their whole capital of happiness it is in indulging the first desire for extra stimulus that the first and deepest danger to domestic peace lies let that stimulus be either bodily or mental its effects are alike to be dreaded the man or the woman to whom habitual excitement of any kind has become essential has taken the first step towards ruin in the case of a woman it leads to discontent fretfulness and dissatisfaction with the quiet duties of domestic life in the case of a man it leads almost invariably to animal stimulus ruinous alike to the powers of body and mind augusta fondly trusting to the virtue of her husband saw no danger in the constant round of engagements which were gradually drawing his attention from the graver cares of business from the pursuit of self-improvement and from the love of herself 
already there was in her horizon the cloud as big as a man's hand the precursor of future darkness and tempest but too confident and buoyant she saw it not it was not until the cares and duties of a mother began to confine her at home that she first felt with a startling sensation of fear that there was an alteration in her husband though even then the change was so shadowy and indefinite that it could not be defined by words it was known by that quick prophetic sense which reveals to the heart of woman the first variation in the pulse of affection though it be so slight that no other touch can detect it edward was still fond affectionate admiring and when he tendered her all the little attentions demanded by her situation or caressed and praised his beautiful son she felt satisfied and happy but when she saw that even without her the convivial circle had its attractions and that he could leave her to join it she sighed she scarce knew why surely she said i am not so selfish as to wish to rob him of pleasure because i cannot enjoy it with him but yet once he told me there was no pleasure where i was not alas is it true what i have so often heard that such feelings cannot always last poor augusta she knew not how deep reason she had to fear she saw not the temptations that surrounded her husband in the circles where to all the stimulus of wit and intellect was often added the zest of wine used far too freely for safety already had edward become familiar with a degree of physical excitement which touches the very verge of intoxication yet strong in self-confidence and deluded by the customs of society he dreamed not of danger the traveller who has passed above the rapids of niagara may have noticed the spot where the first white sparkling ripple announces the downward tendency of the waters all here is brilliancy and beauty and as the waters ripple and dance in the sunbeam they seem only as if inspired by a spirit of new life and not as hastening to a dreadful fall so the first approach to intemperance that ruins both body and soul seems only like the buoyancy and exulting freshness of a new life and the unconscious voyager feels his bark undulating with a thrill of delight ignorant of the inexorable hurry the tremendous sweep with which the laughing waters urge him on beyond the reach of hope or recovery it was at this period in the life of edward that one judicious and manly friend who would have had the courage to point out to him the danger that every one else perceived might have saved him but among the circle of his acquaintances there was none such let every man mind his own business was their universal maxim true heads were gravely shaken and mr a regretted to mr b that so promising a young man seemed about to ruin himself but one was no relation of edwards and the other felt a delicacy in speaking on such a subject and therefore according to a very ancient precedent they passed by on the other side yet it was at mr a s sideboard always sparkling with the choicest wine that he had felt the first excitement of extra stimulus it was at mr b s house that the convivial club began to hold their meetings which after a time found a more appropriate place in a public hotel it is thus that the sober the regular and the discreet whose constitution saves them from liabilities to excess will accompany the ardent and excitable to the very verge of danger and then wonder at their want of self-control it was a cold winter evening and the wind whistled drearily around the closed shutters of the parlour in which augusta was sitting everything around her bore the marks of elegance and comfort splendid books and engravings lay about in every direction vases of rare and costly flowers exhaled perfume and magnificent mirrors multiplied every object all spoke of luxury and repose save the anxious and sad countenance of its mistress it was late and she had watched anxiously for her husband for many long hours she drew out her gold and diamond repeater and looked at it it was long past midnight 
she sighed as she remembered the pleasant evenings they had passed together as her eye fell on the books they had read together and on her piano and harp now silent and thought of all he had said and looked in those days when each was all to the other she was aroused from this melancholy reverie by a loud knocking at the street door she hastened to open it but started back at the sight it disclosed her husband borne by four men dead is he dead she screamed in agony no ma'am said one of the men but he might as well be dead as in such a fix as this the whole truth in all its degradation flashed on the mind of augusta without a question or comment she motioned to the sofa in the parlour and her husband was laid there she locked the street door and when the last retreating footstep had died away she turned to the sofa and stood gazing in fixed and almost stupefied silence on the face of her senseless husband at once she realized the whole of her fearful lot she saw before her the blight of her own affections the ruin of her helpless children the disgrace and misery of her husband she looked around her in helpless despair for she well knew the power of the vice whose deadly seal was set upon her husband as one who is struggling and sinking in the waters casts a last dizzy glance at the green sunny banks and distant trees which seem sliding from his view so did all the scenes of her happy days pass in a moment before her and she groaned aloud in bitterness of spirit great god help me help me she prayed save him oh save my husband augusta was a woman of no common energy of spirit and when the first wild burst of anguish was over she resolved not to be wanting to her husband and children in a crisis so dreadful when he awakes she mentally exclaimed i will warn and implore i will pour out my whole soul to save him my poor husband you have been misled betrayed but you are too good too generous too noble to be sacrificed without a struggle it was late the next morning before the stupor in which edward was plunged began to pass off he slowly opened his eyes started up wildly gazed hurriedly around the room till his eye met the fixed and sorrowful gaze of his wife the past instantly flashed upon him and a deep flush passed over his countenance there was a dead a solemn silence until augusta yielding to her agony threw herself into his arms and wept then you do not hate me augusta said he sorrowfully hate you never but oh edward edward what has beguiled you my wife you once promised to be my guardian in virtue such you are and will be oh augusta you have looked on what you shall never see again never never so help me god said he looking up with solemn earnestness and augusta as she gazed on the noble face the ardent expression of sincerity and remorse could not doubt that her husband was saved but edward's plan of reformation had one grand defect it was merely modification and retrenchment and not entire abandonment he could not feel it necessary to cut himself off entirely from the scenes and associations where temptation had met him he considered not that when the temperate flow of the blood and the even balance of the nerves have once been destroyed there is ever after a double and fourfold liability which often makes a man the sport of the first untoward chance he still contrived to stimulate sufficiently to prevent the return of a calm and healthy state of the mind and body and to make constant self-control and watchfulness necessary it is a great mistake to call nothing intemperance but that degree of physical excitement which completely overthrows the mental powers there is a state of nervous excitability resulting from what is often called moderate stimulation which often long precedes this and is in regard to it like the premonitory warnings of the fatal cholera an unsuspected draught on the vital powers from which at any moment they may sink into irremediable collapse it is in this state often that the spirit of gambling or of wild speculation is induced by the morbid cravings of an over-stimulated system 
unsatisfied with the healthy and regular routine of business and the laws of gradual and solid prosperity the excited and unsteady imagination leads its subjects to daring risks with the alternative of unbounded gain on the one side or of utter ruin on the other and when as is too often the case that ruin comes unrestrained and desperate intemperance is the wretched resort to allay the ravings of disappointment and despair such was the case with edward he had lost his interest in his regular business and he embarked the bulk of his property in a brilliant scheme then in vogue and when he found a crisis coming threatening ruin and beggary he had recourse to the fatal stimulus which alas he had never wholly abandoned at this time he spent some months in a distant city separated from his wife and family while the insidious power of temptation daily increased as he kept up by artificial stimulus the flagging vigour of his mind and nervous system it came at last the blow which shattered alike his brilliant dreams and his real prosperity the large fortune brought by his wife vanished in a moment so that scarcely a pittance remained in his hands from the distant city where he had been to superintend his schemes he thus wrote to his too confiding wife augusta all is over expect no more from your husband believe no more of his promises for he is lost to you and you to him augusta our property is gone your property which i have blindly risked is all swallowed up but is that the worst no no augusta i am lost lost body and soul and as irretrievably as the perishing riches i have squandered once i had energy health nerve resolution but all are gone yes yes i have yielded i do yield daily to what is at once my tormentor and my temporary refuge from intolerable misery you remember the sad hour you first knew your husband was a drunkard your look on that morning of misery shall i ever forget it yet blind and confiding as you were how soon did your ill-judged confidence in me return vain hopes i was even then past recovery even then sealed over to blackness of darkness for ever alas my wife my peerless wife why am i your husband why the father of such children as you have given me is there nothing in your unequalled loveliness nothing in the innocence of our helpless babes that is powerful enough to recall me no there is not augusta you know not the dreadful gnawing the intolerable agony of this master passion i walk the floor i think of my own dear home my high hopes my proud expectations my children my wife my own immortal soul i feel that i am sacrificing all feel it till i am withered with agony but the hour comes the burning hour and all is in vain i shall return to you no more augusta all the little wreck i have saved i send you have friends relatives above all you have an energy of mind a capacity of resolute action beyond that of ordinary women and you shall never be bound the living to the dead true you will suffer thus to burst the bonds that unite us but be resolute for you will suffer more to watch from day to day the slow workings of death and ruin in your husband would you stay with me to see every vestige of what you once loved passing away to endure the caprice the moroseness the delirious anger of one no longer master of himself would you make your children victims and fellow-sufferers with you no dark and dreadful is my path i will walk it alone no one shall go with me in some peaceful retirement you may concentrate your strong feelings upon your children and bring them up to fill a place in your heart which a worthless husband has abandoned if i leave you now you will remember me as i have been you will love me and weep for me when dead but if you stay with me your love will be worn out i shall become the object of disgust and loathing therefore farewell my wife my first best love farewell with you i part with hope and with hope farewell fear farewell remorse all good to me is lost evil be thou my good this is a wild strain but fit for me do not seek for me do not write nothing can save me 
thus abruptly began and ended the letter that conveyed to augusta the death doom of her hopes there are moments of agony when the most worldly heart is pressed upward to god even as a weight will force upward the reluctant water augusta had been a generous a high-minded and affectionate woman but she had lived entirely for this world her chief good had been her husband and her children these had been her pride her reliance her dependence strong in her own resources she had never felt the need of looking to a higher power for assistance and happiness but when this letter fell from her trembling hand her heart died within her at its wild and reckless bitterness in her desperation she looked up to god what have i to live for now was the first feeling of her heart but she repressed this inquiry of selfish agony and besought almighty assistance to nerve her weakness and here first began that practical acquaintance with the truths and hopes of religion which changed her whole character the possibility of blind confiding idolatry of any earthly object was swept away by the fall of her husband and with the full energy of a decided and desolate spirit she threw herself on the protection of an almighty helper she followed her husband to the city whither he had gone found him and vainly attempted to save there were the usual alternations of short-lived reformations exciting hopes only to be destroyed there was the gradual sinking of the body the decay of moral feeling and principle the slow but sure approach of disgusting animalism which marks the progress of the drunkard it was some years after that a small and partly ruinous tenement in the outskirts of a received a new family the group consisted of four children whose wan and wistful countenances and still unchildlike deportment testified an early acquaintance with want and sorrow there was the mother faded and careworn whose dark and melancholy eyes pale cheeks and compressed lips told of years of anxiety and endurance there was the father with haggard face unsteady step and that callous reckless air that betrayed long familiarity with degradation and crime who that had seen edward howard in the morning and freshness of his days could have recognized him in this miserable husband and father or who in this worn and woe-stricken woman would have known the beautiful brilliant and accomplished augusta yet such changes are not fancy as many a bitter and broken heart can testify augusta had followed her guilty husband through many a change and many a weary wandering all hope of reformation had gradually faded away her own eyes had seen her ears had heard all those disgusting details too revolting to be portrayed for in drunkenness there is no royal road no salvo for greatness of mind refinement of taste or tenderness of feeling all alike are merged in the corruption of a moral death the traveller who met edward reeling by the roadside was sometimes startled to hear the fragments of classical lore or wild bursts of half-remembered poetry mixing strangely with the imbecile merriment of intoxication but when he stopped to gaze there was no further mark on his face or in his eye by which he could be distinguished from the loathsome and lowest drunkard augusta had come with her husband to a city where they were wholly unknown that she might at least escape the degradation of their lot in the presence of those who had known them in better days the long and dreadful struggle that annihilated the hopes of this life had raised her feelings to rest upon the next and the habit of communion with god induced by sorrows which nothing else could console had given a tender dignity to her character such as nothing else could bestow it is true she deeply loved her children but it was with a wholly chastened love such as inspired the sentiment once breathed by him who was made perfect through sufferings for their sakes i sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified poverty deep poverty had followed their steps but yet she had not fainted talents which in her happier days had been nourished merely as luxuries were now stretched to the utmost to furnish a support while from the resources of her own reading she drew that which laid the foundation for early mental culture in her children 
augusta had been here but a few weeks before her footsteps were traced by her only brother who had lately discovered her situation and urged her to forsake her unworthy husband and find refuge with him augusta my sister i have found you he exclaimed as he suddenly entered one day while she was busied with the work of her family henry my dear brother there was a momentary illumination of countenance accompanying these words which soon faded into a mournful quietness as she cast her eyes around on the scanty accommodations and mean apartment i see how it is augusta step by step you are sinking dragged down by a vain sense of duty to one no longer worthy i cannot bear it any longer i have come to take you away augusta turned from him and looked abstractedly out the window her features settled in thought their expression gradually deepened from their usual tone of mild resigned sorrow to one of keen anguish henry said she turning towards him never was mortal woman so blessed in another as i once was in him how can i forget it who knew him in those days that did not admire and love him they tempted and ensnared him and even i urged him into the path of danger he fell and there was none to help i urged reformation and he again and again promised resolved and began but again they tempted him even his very best friends yes and that too when they knew his danger they led him on as far as it was safe for them to go and when the sweep of his more excitable temperament took him past the point of safety and decency they stood by and coolly wondered and lamented how often was he led on by such heartless friends to humiliating falls and then driven to desperation by the cold look averted faces and cruel sneers of those whose medium temperament and cooler blood saved them from the snares which they saw were enslaving him what if i had forsaken him then what account should i have rendered to god every time a friend has been alienated by his comrades it has seemed to seal him with another seal i am his wife and mine will be the last henry when i leave him i know his eternal ruin is sealed i cannot do it now a little longer a little longer the hour i see must come i know my duty to my children forbids me to keep them here take them they are my last earthly comforts henry but you must take them away it may be o oh god perhaps it must be that i shall soon follow but not till i have tried once more what is this present life to one who has suffered as i have nothing but eternity o oh henry eternity how can i abandon him to everlasting despair under the breaking of my heart i have borne up i have borne up under all that can try a woman but this thought she stopped and seemed struggling with herself but at last borne down by a tide of agony she leaned her head on her hands the tears streamed through her fingers and her whole frame shook with convulsive sobs her brother wept with her nor dared he again to touch the point so solemnly guarded the next day augusta parted from her children hoping something from feelings that possibly might be stirred by their absence in the bosom of their father it was about a week after this that augusta one evening presented herself at the door of a rich mr l whose princely mansion was one of the ornaments of the city of a it was not till she reached the sumptuous drawing-room that she recognized in mr l one whom she and her husband had frequently met in the gay circles of their early life altered as she was mr l did not recognize her but compassionately handed her a chair and requested her to wait the return of his lady who was out and then turning he resumed his conversation with another gentleman now dallas said he you are altogether excessive and intemperate in this matter society is not to be reformed by every man directing his efforts towards his neighbour but by every man taking care of himself it is you and i my dear sir who must begin with ourselves and every other man must do the same and then society will be effectually reformed 
now this modern way by which every man considers it his duty to attend to the spiritual matters of his next door neighbour is taking the business at the wrong end altogether it makes a vast deal of appearance but it does very little good but suppose your neighbour feels no disposition to attend to his own improvement what then why then it is his own concern and not mine what my maker requires is that i do my duty and not fret about my neighbours but my friend that is the very question what is the duty your maker requires does it not include some regard to your neighbour some care and thought for his interest and improvement well while i do that by setting a good example i do not mean by example what you do that is that i am to stop drinking wine because it may lead him to drink brandy any more than that i must stop eating because he may eat too much and become a dyspeptic but that i am to use my wine and everything else temperately and decently and thus set him a good example the conversation was here interrupted by the return of mrs l it recalled in all its freshness to the mind of augusta the days when both she and her husband had thus spoken and thought ah how did these sentiments appear to her now lonely helpless forlorn the wife of a ruined husband the mother of more than orphan children how different from what they seemed when secure in ease in wealth in gratified affections she thoughtlessly echoed the common phraseology why must people concern themselves so much in their neighbours affairs let every man mind his own business augusta received in silence from mrs l the fine sewing for which she came and left the room ellen said mr l to his wife that poor woman must be in trouble of some kind or other you must go some time and see if anything can be done for her how singular said mrs l she reminds me all the time of augusta howard you remember her my dear yes poor thing and her husband too that was a shocking affair of edward howard's i hear that he became an intemperate worthless fellow who could have thought it but you recollect my dear said mrs l i predicted it six months before it was talked of you remember at the wine party which you gave after mary's wedding he was so excited that he was hardly decent i mentioned then that he was getting into dangerous ways but he was such an excitable creature that two or three glasses would put him quite beside himself and there is george eldon who takes off his ten or twelve glasses and no one suspects it well it was a great pity replied mr l howard was worth a dozen george eldon's do you suppose said dallas who had listened thus far in silence that if he had moved in a circle where it was the universal custom to banish all stimulating drinks he would thus have fallen i cannot say said mr l perhaps not mr dallas was a gentleman of fortune and leisure and of an ardent and enthusiastic temperament whatever engaged him absorbed his whole soul and of late years his mind had become deeply engaged in schemes of philanthropy for the improvement of his fellow-men he had in his benevolent ministrations often passed the dwelling of edward and was deeply interested in the pale and patient wife and mother he made acquaintance with her through the aid of her children and in one way and another learned particulars of their history that awakened the deepest interest and concern none but a mind as sanguine as his would have dreamed of attempting to remedy such hopeless misery by the reformation of him who was its cause but such a plan had actually occurred to him the remarks of mr and mrs l recalled the idea and he soon found that his intended protege was the very edward howard whose early history was thus disclosed he learned all the minutiae from these his early associates without disclosing his aim and left them still more resolved upon his benevolent plan he watched his opportunity when edward was free from the influence of stimulus and it was just after the loss of his children had called forth some remains of his better nature gradually and kindly he tried to touch the springs of his mind and awaken some of its buried sensibilities it is in vain mr dallas to talk thus to me said edward when one day with the strong eloquence of excited feeling he painted the motives for attempting reformation 
you might as well attempt to reclaim the lost in hell do you think he continued in a wild determined manner do you think i do not know all you can tell me i have it all by heart sir no one can preach such discourses as i can on this subject i know all believe all as the devils believe and tremble ay but said dallas to you there is hope you are not to ruin yourself for ever and who the devil are you to speak to me in this way said edward looking up from his sullen despair with a gleam of curiosity if not of hope god's messenger to you edward howard said dallas fixing his keen eye upon him solemnly to you edward howard who have thrown away talents hope and health who have blasted the heart of your wife and beggared your suffering children to you i am the messenger of your god by me he offers health and hope and self-respect and the regard of your fellow-men you may heal the broken heart of your wife and give back a father to your helpless children think of it howard what if it were possible only suppose it what would it be again to feel yourself a man beloved and respected as you once were with a happy home a cheerful wife and smiling little ones think how you could repay your poor wife for all her tears what hinders you from gaining all this just what hindered the rich man in hell between us there is a great gulf fixed it lies between me and all that is good my wife my children my hope of heaven are all on the other side ay but this gulf can be passed howard what would you give to be a temperate man what would i give said howard he thought for a moment and burst into tears ah i see how it is said dallas you need a friend and god has sent you one what can you do for me mr dallas said edward in a tone of wonder at the confidence of his assurances i will tell you what i can do i can take you to my house and give you a room and watch over you until the strongest temptations are past i can give you business again i can do all for you that needs to be done if you will give yourself to my care o oh, god of mercy exclaimed the unhappy man is there hope for me i cannot believe it possible but take me where you choose i will follow and obey a few hours witnessed the transfer of the lost husband to one of the retired apartments in the elegant mansion of dallas where he found his anxious and grateful wife still stationed as his watchful guardian medical treatment healthful exercise useful employment simple food and pure water were connected with a personal supervision by dallas which while gently and politely sustained at first amounted to actual imprisonment for a time the reaction from the sudden suspension of habitual stimulus was dreadful and even with tears did the unhappy man entreat to be permitted to abandon the undertaking but the resolute steadiness of dallas and the tender entreaties of his wife prevailed it is true that he might be said to be saved so as by fire for a fever and a long and fierce delirium wasted him almost to the borders of the grave but at length the struggle between life and death was over and though it left him stretched on the bed of sickness emaciated and weak yet he was restored to his right mind and was conscious of returning health let any one who has laid a friend in the grave and known what it is to have the heart fail with longing for them day by day imagine the dreamy and unreal joy of augusta when she began again to see in edward the husband so long lost to her it was as if the grave had given back the dead augusta said he faintly as after a long and quiet sleep he awoke free from delirium she bent over him augusta i am redeemed i am saved i feel in myself that i am made whole the high heart of augusta melted at these words she trembled and wept her husband wept also and after a pause he continued it is more than being restored to this life i feel that it is the beginning of eternal life it is the saviour who sought me out and i know that he is able to keep me from falling but we will draw a veil over a scene which words have little power to paint 
pray dallas said mr l one day who is that fine-looking young man whom i met in your office this morning i thought his face seemed familiar it is a mr howard a young lawyer whom i have lately taken into business with me strange impossible said mr l surely this cannot be the howard that i once knew i believe he is said mr dallas why i thought he was gone dead and done over long ago with intemperance he was so few have ever sunk lower but he now promises even to outdo all that was hoped of him strange why dallas what did bring about this change i feel a delicacy in mentioning how it came about to you mr l as there undoubtedly was a great deal of interference with other men's matters in the business in short the young man fell in the way of one of those meddlesome fellows who go prowling about distributing tracts forming temperance societies and all that sort of stuff come come dallas said mr l smiling i must hear the story for all that first call with me at this house said dallas stopping before the door of a neat little mansion they were soon in the parlour the first sight that met their eyes was edward howard who with a cheek glowing with exercise was tossing aloft a blooming boy while augusta was watching his motions her face radiant with smiles mr and mrs howard this is mr l an old acquaintance i believe there was a moment of mutual embarrassment and surprise soon dispelled however by the frank cordiality of edward mr l sat down but could scarce withdraw his eyes from the countenance of augusta in whose eloquent face he recognized a beauty of a higher caste than even in her earlier days he glanced about the apartment it was simply but tastefully furnished and wore an air of retired domestic comfort there were books engravings and musical instruments above all there were four happy healthy-looking children pursuing studies or sports at the farther end of the room after a short call they regained the street dallas you are a happy man said mr l that family will be a mine of jewels to you he was right every soul saved from pollution and ruin is a jewel to him that reclaims it whose lustre only eternity can disclose and therefore it is written they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever and ever end of chapter nine chapter ten of the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe chapter ten cousin william in a stately red house in one of the villages of new england lived the heroine of our story she had every advantage of rank and wealth for her father was a deacon of the church and owned sheep and oxen and exceeding much substance there was an appearance of respectability and opulence about all the demeans the house stood almost concealed amid a forest of apple trees in spring blushing with blossoms and in autumn golden with fruit and near by might be seen the garden surrounded by a red picket fence enclosing all sorts of magnificence there in autumn might be seen abundant squash vines which seemed puzzled for room where to bestow themselves and bright golden squashes and full orbed yellow pumpkins looking as satisfied as the evening sun when he has just had his face washed in a shower and is sinking soberly to bed there were superannuated seed cucumbers enjoying the pleasures of a contemplative old age and indian corn nicely done up in green silk with a specimen tassel hanging at the end of each ear the beams of the summer sun darted through rows of crimson currants abounding on bushes by the fence 
while a sulky black currant bush sat scowling in one corner a sort of garden curiosity but time would fail us were we to enumerate all the wealth of deacon israel taylor he himself belonged to that necessary class of beings who though remarkable for nothing at all are very useful in filling up the links of society far otherwise was his sister-in-law mrs abigail evitts who on the demise of the deacon's wife had assumed the reins of government in the household this lady was of the same opinion that has animated many illustrious philosophers namely that the affairs of this world need a great deal of seeing to in order to have them go on prosperously and although she did not like them engage in the supervision of the universe she made amends by unremitting diligence in the department under her care in her mind there was an evident necessity that every one should be up and doing monday because it was washing day tuesday because it was ironing day wednesday because it was baking day thursday because to-morrow was friday and so on to the end of the week then she had the care of reminding all in the house of everything each was to do from week's end to week's end and she was so faithful in this respect that scarcely an original act of volition took place in the family the poor deacon was reminded when he went out and when he came in when he sat down and when he rose up so that an act of omission could only have been committed through sheer malice prepense but the supervision of a whole family of children afforded to a lady of her active turn of mind more abundant matter of exertion to see that their faces were washed their clothes mended and their catechism learned to see that they did not pick the flowers nor throw stones at the chickens nor sophisticate the great house dog was an accumulation of care that devolved almost entirely on mrs abigail so that by her own account she lived and throve by a perpetual miracle the eldest of her charge at the time this story begins was a girl just arrived at young ladyhood and her name was mary now we know that people very seldom have stories written about them who have not sylph-like forms and glorious eyes or at least a certain inexpressible charm diffused over their whole person but stories have of late so much abounded that they actually seem to have used up all the eyes hair teeth lips and forms necessary for a heroine so that no one can now pretend to find an original collection wherewith to set one forth these things considered i regard it as fortunate that my heroine was not a beauty she looked neither like a sylph nor an oread nor a fairy she had neither l'air distingue nor l'air magnifique but bore a great resemblance to a real mortal girl such as you might pass a dozen of without any particular comment one of those appearances which though common as water may like that be coloured any way by the associations you connect with it accordingly a faultless taste in dress a perfect ease and gaiety of manner a constant flow of kindly feeling seemed in her case to produce all the effect of beauty her manners had just dignity enough to repel impertinence without destroying the careless freedom and sprightliness in which she commonly indulged no person had a merrier run of stories songs and village traditions and all those odds and ends of character which form the materials for animated conversation she had read too everything she could find rollin's history and scott's family bible that stood in the glass bookcase in the best room and an odd volume of shakespeare and now and then one of scott's novels borrowed from a somewhat literary family in the neighbourhood she also kept an album to write her thoughts in and was in a constant habit of cutting out all the pretty poetry from the corners of the newspapers besides drying forget-me-nots and rosebuds in memory of different particular friends with a number of other little sentimental practices to which young ladies of sixteen and thereabout are addicted 
she was also endowed with great constructiveness so that in these days of ladies fairs there was nothing from bellows needle-books down to web-footed pincushions to which she could not turn her hand her sewing certainly was extraordinary we think too little is made of this in the accomplishments of heroines her stitching was like rows of pearls and her cross-stitching was fairy-like and for sewing over and over as the village schoolma'am hath it she had not her equal and what shall we say of her pies and puddings they would have converted the most reprobate old bachelor in the world and then her sweeping and dusting many daughters have done virtuously but thou excellest them all and now what do you suppose is coming next why a young gentleman of course for about this time comes to settle in the village and take charge of the academy a certain william barton now if you wish to know more particularly who he was we only wish we could refer you to mrs abigail who was most accomplished in genealogies and old wife's fables and she would have told you that her granther ike evitts married a wife who was second cousin to peter scranton who was great uncle to polly mosley whose daughter mary married william barton's father just about the time old squire peter's house was burned down and then would follow an account of the domestic history of all branches of the family since they came over from england be that as it may it is certain that mrs abigail denominated him cousin and that he came to the deacons to board and he had not been there more than a week and made sundry observations on miss mary before he determined to call her cousin too which he accomplished in the most natural way in the world mary was at first somewhat afraid of him because she had heard that he had studied through all that was to be studied in greek and latin and german too and she saw a library of books in his room that made her sigh every time she looked at them to think how much there was to be learned of which she was ignorant but all this wore away and presently they were the best friends in the world he gave her books to read and he gave her lessons in french nothing puzzled by that troublesome verb which must be first conjugated whether in french latin or english then he gave her a deal of good advice about the cultivation of her mind and the formation of her character all of which was very improving and tended greatly to consolidate their friendship but unfortunately for mary william made quite as favourable an impression on the female community generally as he did on her having distinguished himself on certain public occasions such as delivering lectures on botany and also at the earnest request of the fourth of july committee pronounced an oration which covered him with glory he had been known also to write poetry and had a retired and romantic air greatly bewitching to those who read bulwer's novels in short it was morally certain according to all rules of evidence that if he had chosen to pay any lady of the village a dozen visits a week she would have considered it as her duty to entertain him william did visit for like many studious people he found a need for the excitement of society but whether it was party or singing school he walked home with mary of course in as steady and domestic a manner as any man who has been married a twelvemonth his air in conversing with her was inevitably more confidential than with any other one and this was cause for envy in many a gentle breast and an interesting diversity of reports with regard to her manner of treating the young gentleman went forth into the village i wonder mary taylor will laugh and joke so much with william barton in company said one her manners are altogether too free said another it is evident she has designs upon him remarked a third and she cannot even conceal it pursued a fourth some sayings of this kind at length reached the ears of mrs abigail who had the best heart in the world and was so indignant that it might have done your heart good to see her still she thought it showed that the girl needed advising and she should talk to mary about the matter 
but she first concluded to advise with william on the subject and therefore after dinner the same day while he was looking over a treatise on trigonometry or conic sections she commenced upon him our mary is growing up a fine girl william was intent on solving a problem and only understanding that something had been said mechanically answered yes a little wild or so said mrs abigail i know it said william fixing his eyes earnestly on e f b c perhaps you think her a little too talkative and free with you sometimes you know girls do not always think what they do certainly said william going on with his problem i think you had better speak to her about it said mrs abigail i think so too said william musing over his completed work till at length he arose put it in his pocket and went to school oh this unlucky concentrativeness how many shocking things a man may endorse by the simple habit of saying yes and no when he is not hearing what is said to him the next morning when william was gone to the academy and mary was washing the breakfast things aunt abigail introduced the subject with great tact and delicacy by remarking mary i guess you'd better be rather less free with william than you have been free said mary starting and nearly dropping the cup from her hand why aunt what do you mean why mary you must not always be around so free and talking with him at home and in company and everywhere it won't do the colour started into mary's cheek and mounted even to her forehead as she answered with a dignified air i have not been too free i know what is right and proper i have not been doing anything that was improper now when one is going to give advice it is very troublesome to have its necessity thus called in question and mrs abigail who was fond of her own opinion felt called upon to defend it why yes you have mary everybody in the village notices it i don't care what everybody in the village says i shall always do what i think proper retorted the young lady i know cousin william does not think so well i think he does from some things i have heard him say oh aunt what have you heard him say said mary nearly upsetting a chair in the eagerness with which she turned to her aunt mercy on us you need not knock the house down mary i don't remember exactly about it only that his way of speaking made me think so oh aunt do tell me what it was and all about it said mary following her aunt who went around dusting the furniture mrs abigail like most obstinate people who feel that they have gone too far and yet are ashamed to go back took refuge in an obstinate generalization and only asserted that she had heard him say things as if he did not quite like her ways this is the most consoling of all methods in which to leave a matter of this kind for a person of active imagination of course in five minutes mary had settled in her mind a list of remarks that would have been suited to any of her village companions as coming from her cousin all the improbability of the thing vanished in the absorbing consideration of its possibility and after a moment's reflection she pressed her lips together in a very firm way and remarked that mr barton would have no occasion to say such things again it was very evident from her heightened colour and dignified air that her state of mind was very heroical as for poor aunt abigail she felt sorry she had vexed her and addressed herself most earnestly to her consolation remarking mary i don't suppose william meant anything he knows you don't mean anything wrong don't mean anything wrong said mary indignantly why child he thinks you don't know much about folks and things and if you have been a little but i have not been it was he that talked with me first it was he that did everything first he called me cousin and he is my cousin no child you are mistaken for you remember his grandfather was i don't care who his grandfather was he has no right to think of me as he does now mary don't go to quarrelling with him he can't help his thoughts you know i don't care what he thinks said mary flinging out of the room with tears in her eyes now when a young lady is in such a state of affliction the first thing to be done is to sit down and cry for two hours or more which mary accomplished in the most thorough manner 
in the meanwhile making many reflections on the instability of human friendships and resolving never to trust any one again as long as she lived and thinking that this was a cold and hollow-hearted world together with many other things she had read in books but never realized so forcibly as at present but what was to be done of course she did not wish to speak a word to william again and wished he did not board there and finally she put on her bonnet and determined to go over to her other aunts in the neighbourhood and spend the day so that she might not see him at dinner but it so happened that mr william on coming home at noon found himself unaccountably lonesome during school recess for dinner and hearing where mary was determined to call after school at night at her aunt's and attend her home accordingly in the afternoon as mary was sitting in the parlour with two or three cousins mr william entered mary was so anxious to look just as if nothing was the matter that she turned away her head and began to look out of the window just as the young gentleman came up to speak to her so after he had twice inquired after her health she drew up very coolly and said did you speak to me sir william looked a little surprised at first but seating himself by her to be sure said he and i came to know why you ran away without leaving any message for me it did not occur to me said mary in the dry tone which in a lady means i will excuse you from any further conversation if you please william felt as if there was something different from common in all this but thought that perhaps he was mistaken and so continued what a pity now that you should be so careless of me when i was so thoughtful of you i have come all this distance to see how you do i am sorry to have given you the trouble said mary cousin are you unwell to-day said william no sir said mary going on with her sewing there was something so marked and decisive in all this that william could scarcely believe his ears he turned away and commenced a conversation with a young lady and mary to show that she could talk if she chose commenced relating a story to her cousins and presently they were all in a loud laugh mary has been full of her knick-knacks to-day said her old uncle joining them william looked at her she never seemed brighter or in better spirits and he began to think that even cousin mary might puzzle a man sometimes he turned away and began a conversation with old mr zachary cone on the raising of buckwheat a subject which evidently required profound thought for he never looked more grave not to say melancholy mary glanced that way and was struck with the sad and almost severe expression with which he was listening to the details of mr zachary and was convinced that he was no more thinking of buckwheat than she was i never thought of hurting his feelings so much said she relenting after all he has been very kind to me but he might have told me about it and not somebody else and hereupon she cast another glance towards him william was not talking but sat with his eyes fixed on the snuffer tray with an intense gravity of gaze that quite troubled her and she could not help again blaming herself to be sure aunt was right he could not help his thoughts i will try to forget it thought she now you must not think mary was sitting still and gazing during this soliloquy no she was talking and laughing apparently the most unconcerned spectator in the room so passed the evening till the little company broke up i am ready to attend you home said william in a tone of cold and almost haughty deference i am obliged to you said the young lady in a similar tone but i shall stay all night then suddenly changing her tone she said no i cannot keep it up any longer i will go home with you cousin william keep up what said william with surprise mary was gone for her bonnet she came out took his arm and walked on a little way you have advised me always to be frank cousin said mary and i must and will be so i shall tell you all though i dare say it is not according to rule all what said william cousin said she not at all regarding what he said i was very much vexed this afternoon so i perceived mary well it is vexatious she continued though after all we cannot expect people to think us perfect 
but i did not think it quite fair in you not to tell me tell you what mary here they came to a place where the road turned through a small patch of woods it was green and shady and enlivened by a lively chatterbox of a brook there was a mossy trunk of a tree that had fallen beside it and made a pretty seat the moonlight lay in little patches upon it as it streamed down through the branches of the trees it was a fairy-looking place and mary stopped and sat down as if to collect her thoughts after picking up a stick and playing a moment in the water she began after all cousin it was very natural in you to say so if you thought so though i should not have supposed you would think so well i should be glad if i could know what it is said william in a tone of patient resignation oh i forgot that i had not told you said she pushing back her hat and speaking like one determined to go through with the thing why cousin i have been told that you spoke of my manners towards yourself as being freer more obtrusive than they should be and now said she her eyes flashing you see it was not a very easy thing to tell you but i began with being frank and i will be so for the sake of satisfying myself to this william simply replied who told you this mary my aunt did she say i said it to her yes and i do not so much object to your saying it as to your thinking it for you know i did not force myself on your notice it was you who sought my acquaintance and won my confidence and that you above all others should think me of me in this way i never did think so mary said william quietly nor ever said so never i should think you might have known it mary but said mary but said william firmly aunt abigail is certainly mistaken well i am glad of it said mary looking relieved and gazing in the brook then looking up with warmth and cousin you never must think so i am ardent and i express myself freely but i never meant i am sure i never should mean anything more than a sister might say and are you sure you never could if all my happiness depended on it mary she turned and looked up in his face and saw a look that brought conviction she rose to go on and her hand was taken and drawn into the arm of her cousin and that was the end of the first and the last difficulty that ever arose between them end of chapter ten chapter eleven of the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe chapter eleven the ministration of our departed friends a new year's reverie it is a beautiful belief that ever round our head are hovering on viewless wings the spirits of the dead while well, every year is taking one and another from the ranks of life and usefulness or the charmed circle of friendship and love it is soothing to remember that the spiritual world is gaining in riches through the poverty of this in early life with our friends all around us hearing their voices cheered by their smiles death and the spiritual world are to us remote misty and half fabulous but as we advance in our journey and voice after voice is hushed and form after form vanishes from our side and our shadow falls almost solitary on the hillside of life the soul by a necessity of its being tends to the unseen and spiritual and pursues in another life those it seeks in vain in this for with every friend that dies dies also some especial form of social enjoyment whose being depended on the peculiar character of that friend till late in the afternoon of life the pilgrim seems to himself to have passed over to the unseen world in successive portions half his own spirit and poor indeed is he who has not familiarized himself with that unknown whither despite himself his soul is earnestly tending one of the deepest and most imperative cravings of the human heart as it follows its beloved ones beyond the veil 
is for some assurance that they still love and care for us could we firmly believe this bereavement would lose half its bitterness as a german writer beautifully expresses it our friend is not wholly gone from us we see across the river of death in the blue distance the smoke of his cottage hence the heart always creating what it desires has ever made the guardianship and ministration of departed spirits a favourite theme of poetic fiction but is it then fiction does revelation which gives so many hopes which nature had not give none here is there no sober certainty to correspond to the inborn and passionate craving of the soul do departed spirits in verity retain any knowledge of what transpires in this world and take any part in its scenes all that revelation says of a spiritual state is more intimation than assertion it has no distinct treatise and teaches nothing apparently of set purpose but gives vague glorious images while now and then some accidental ray of intelligence looks out like eyes of cherubs shining from out the veil that hid the ark but out of all the different hints and assertions of the bible we think a better inferential argument might be constructed to prove the ministration of departed spirits than for many a doctrine which has passed in its day for the height of orthodoxy first then the bible distinctly says that there is a class of invisible spirits who minister to the children of men are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation it is said of little children that their angels do always behold the face of our father which is in heaven this last passage from the words of our saviour taken in connection with the well-known tradition of his time fully recognizes the idea of individual guardian spirits for god's government over mind is it seems throughout one of intermediate agencies and these not chosen at random but with the nicest reference to their adaptation to the purpose intended not even the all-seeing all-knowing one was deemed perfectly adapted to become a human saviour without a human experience knowledge intuitive gained from above of human wants and woes was not enough to it must be added the home-born certainty of consciousness and memory the head of all mediation must become human is it likely then that in selecting subordinate agencies this so necessary a requisite of a human life and experience is overlooked while around the throne of god stand spirits now sainted and glorified yet thrillingly conscious of a past experience of sin and sorrow and trembling in sympathy with temptations and struggles like their own is it likely that he would pass by these souls thus burning for the work and commit it to those bright abstract beings whose knowledge and experience are comparatively so distant and so cold it is strongly in confirmation of this idea that in the transfiguration scene which seems to have been intended purposely to give the disciples a glimpse of the glorified state of their master we find him attended by two spirits of earth moses and elias which appeared with him in glory and spake of his death which he should accomplish at jerusalem it appears that these so long departed ones were still mingling in deep sympathy with the tide of human affairs not only aware of the present but also informed as to the future in coincidence with this idea are all those passages which speak of the redeemed of earth as being closely and indissolubly identified with christ members of his body of his flesh and his bones it is not to be supposed that those united to jesus above all others by so vivid a sympathy and community of interests are left out as instruments in that great work of human regeneration which so engrosses him and when we hear christians spoken of as kings and priests unto god as those who shall judge angels we see it more than intimated that they are to be the partners and actors in that great work of spiritual regeneration of which jesus is the head what then may we look among the band of ministering spirits for our own departed ones whom would god be more likely to send us have we in heaven a friend who knew us to the heart's core a friend to whom we have unfolded our soul in its most secret recesses 
to whom we have confessed our weaknesses and deplored our griefs if we are to have a ministering spirit who better adapted have we not memories which correspond to such a belief when our soul has been cast down has never an invisible voice whispered there is lifting up have not gales and breezes of sweet and healing thought been wafted over us as if an angel had shaken from his wings the odours of paradise many a one we are confident can remember such things and whence come they why do the children of the pious mother whose grave has grown green and smooth with years seem often to walk through perils and dangers fearful and imminent as the crossing mohammed's fiery gulf on the edge of a drawn sword yet walk unhurt ah could we see that attendant form that face where the angel conceals not the mother our question would be answered it may be possible that a friend is sometimes taken because the divine one sees that his ministry can act more powerfully from the unseen world than amid the infirmities of mortal intercourse here the soul distracted and hemmed in by human events and by bodily infirmities often scarce knows itself and makes no impression on others correspondent to its desires the mother would fain electrify the heart of her child she yearns and burns in vain to make her soul effective on its soul and to inspire it with a spiritual and holy life but all her own weaknesses faults and mortal cares cramp and confine her till death breaks all fetters and then first truly alive risen purified and at rest she may do calmly sweetly and certainly what amid the tempests and tossings of life she laboured for painfully and fitfully so also to generous souls who burn for the good of man who deplore the shortness of life and the little that is permitted to any individual agency on earth does this belief open a heavenly field think not father or brother long labouring for man till thy son stands on the western mountains think not that thy day in this world is over perhaps like jesus thou hast lived a human life and gained a human experience to become under and like him a saviour of thousands thou hast been through the preparation but thy real work of good thy full power of doing is yet to begin but again there are some spirits and those of earth's choicest to whom so far as enjoyment to themselves or others is concerned this life seems to have been a total failure a hard hand from the first and all the way through life seems to have been laid upon them they seem to live only to be chastened and crushed and we lay them in the grave at last in mournful silence to such what a vision is opened by this belief this hard discipline has been the school and task work by which their soul has been fitted for their invisible labours in a future life and when they pass the gates of the grave their course of benevolent acting first begins and they find themselves delighted possessors of what through many years they have sighed for the power of doing good the year just passed like all other years has taken from a thousand circles the sainted the just and the beloved there are spots in a thousand graveyards which have become this year dearer than all the living world but in the loneliness of sorrow how cheering to think that our lost ones are not wholly gone from us they still may move about in our homes shedding around an atmosphere of purity and peace promptings of good and reproofs of evil we are compassed about by a cloud of witnesses whose hearts throb in sympathy with every effort and struggle and who thrill with joy at every success how should this thought check and rebuke every worldly feeling and unworthy purpose and enshrine us in the midst of a forgetful and unspiritual world with an atmosphere of heavenly peace they have overcome have risen are crowned glorified but still they remain to us our assistants our comforters and in every hour of darkness their voice speaks to us so we grieved so we struggled so we fainted so we doubted but we have overcome we have obtained we have seen we have found and in our victory 
behold the certainty of thy own end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe chapter twelve mrs a and mrs b or what she thinks about it mrs a and mrs b were next-door neighbours and intimate friends that is to say they took tea with each other very often and in confidential strains discoursed of stockings and pocket-handkerchiefs of puddings and carpets of cookery and domestic economy through all its branches i think on the whole said mrs a with an air of profound reflection that gingerbread is the cheapest and healthiest cake one can make i make a good deal of it and let my children have as much as they want of it i used to do so said mrs b but i haven't had any made these two months ah why not said mrs a why it is some trouble and then though it is cheap it is cheaper not to have any and on the whole the children are quite as well contented without it and so we are fallen into the way of not having any but one must keep some kind of cake in the house said mrs a so i have always heard and thought and practised said mrs b but really of late i have questioned the need of it the conversation gradually digressed from this point into various intricate speculations on domestic economy and at last each lady went home to put her children to bed a fortnight after the two ladies were again in conclave at mrs b s tea-table which was graced by some unusually nice gingerbread i thought you had given up making gingerbread said mrs a you told me so a fortnight ago at my house so i had said mrs a but since that conversation i have been making it again why so oh i thought that since you thought it economical enough certainly i might and that if you thought it necessary to keep some sort of cake in the closet perhaps it was best i should mrs a laughed well now said she i have not made any gingerbread or cake of any kind since that same conversation indeed no i said to myself if mrs b thinks it will do to go without cake in the house i suppose i might as she says it is some additional expense and trouble and so i gave it up both ladies laughed and you laughed too my dear lady reader but have you never done the same thing have you never altered your dress or your arrangements or your housekeeping because somebody else was of a different way of thinking or managing and may not that very somebody at the same time have been moved to make some change through a similar observation on you a large party is to be given by the young lads of inn to the young lassies of the same place they are to drive out together to a picnic in the woods and to come home by moonlight the weather is damp and uncertain the ground chill and young people as in all ages before the flood and since not famous for the grace of prudence for all which reasons almost every mamma hesitates about her daughter's going thinks it a very great pity the thing has been started i really don't like this thing says mrs g it's not a kind of thing that i approve of and if mrs x was not going to let her daughters go i should set myself against it how mrs x who is so very nice in her notions can sanction such a thing i cannot see i am really surprised at mrs x all this time poor unconscious mrs x is in a similar tribulation this is a very disagreeable affair to me she says i really have almost a mind to say that my girls shall not go but mrs g s daughters are going and mrs c s and mrs w s and of course it would be idle for me to oppose it i should not like to cast any reflections on a course sanctioned by ladies of such prudence and discretion in the same manner mrs a b and c and the good matrons through the alphabet generally with doleful lamentations each one consents to the thing that she allows not and the affair proceeds swimmingly to the great satisfaction of the juveniles 
now and then it is true some individual sort of body who might be designated by the angular and decided letters k or l says to her son or daughter no i don't approve of the thing and is deaf to the oft urged mrs a b and c do so i have nothing to do with mrs a b and c's arrangements says this impracticable mrs k or l i only know what is best for my children and they shall not go again mrs g is going to give a party and now shall she give wine or not mrs g has heard an abundance of temperance speeches and appeals heard the duties of ladies in the matter of sanctioning temperance movements aptly set forth but none of these things move her half so much as another consideration she has heard that mrs d introduced wine into her last soiree mrs d s husband has been a leading orator of the temperance society and mrs d is no less a leading member in the circles of fashion now mrs g s soul is in great perplexity if she only could be sure that the report about mrs d is authentic why then of course the thing is settled regret it as much as she may she cannot get through her party without the wine and so at last come the party and the wine mrs d who was incorrectly stated to have had the article at her last soiree has it at her next one and quotes discreet mrs g as her precedent mrs p is greatly scandalized at this because mrs g is a member of the church and mr d a leading temperance orator but since they will do it it is not for her to be nice and so she follows the fashion mrs n comes home from church on sunday rolling up her eyes with various appearances of horror and surprise well i am going to give up trying to restrain my girls from dressing extravagantly it's of no use trying no use in the world why mother what's the matter exclaimed the girls aforesaid delighted to hear such encouraging declarations why didn't you see mrs k s daughters sitting in the pew before us with feathers in their bonnets if mrs k is coming out in this way i shall give up i shan't try any longer i am going to get just what i want and dress as much as i've a mind to girls you may get those visites that you were looking at at mr b s store last week the next sunday mrs k s girls in turn begin there mamma you are always lecturing us about economy and all that and wanting us to wear our old mantillas another winter and there are mrs n s girls shining out in new visites mamma looks sensible and judicious and tells the girls they ought not to see what people are wearing in church on sundays but it becomes evident before the week is through that she has not forgotten the observation she is anxiously pricing visites and looking thoughtful as one on the eve of an important determination and the next sunday the girls appear in full splendor with new visites to the increasing horror of mrs n so goes the shuttlecock back and forward kept up on both sides by most judicious hands in like manner at a modern party a circle of matrons sit in edifying conclave and lament the degeneracy of the age these parties that begin at nine o'clock and end at two or three in the morning are shameful things says fat mrs q complacently fanning herself n b mrs q is plotting to have one the very next week and has come just to see the fashions oh dreadful dreadful exclaim in one chorus meek mrs m and tall mrs f and stiff mrs j they are very unhealthy says mrs f they disturb all family order says mrs j they make one so sleepy the next day says mrs m they are very laborious to get up and entirely useless says mrs q at the same time counting across the room the people that she shall invite next week mrs m and mrs f diverge into a most edifying strain of moral reflections on the improvement of time the necessity of sobriety and moderation the evils of conformity to the world till one is tempted to feel that the tract society ought to have their remarks for general circulation were one not damped by the certain knowledge that before the winter is out each of these ladies will give exactly such another party and now are all these respectable ladies hypocritical or insincere 
by no means they believe every word they say but a sort of necessity is laid upon them a spell and before the breath of the multitude their individual resolution melts away as the frosty tracery melts from the window-panes of a crowded room a great many do this habitually resignedly as a matter of course ask them what they think to be right and proper and they will tell you sensibly coherently and quite to the point in one direction ask them what they are going to do ah that is quite another matter they are going to do what is generally done what mrs a b and c do they have long since made over their conscience to the keeping of the public that is to say of good society and are thus rid of a troublesome burden of responsibility again there are others who mean in general to have an opinion and will of their own but imperceptibly as one and another take a course opposed to their own sense of right and propriety their resolution quietly melts and melts till every individual outline of it is gone and they do as others do yet is this influence of one human being over another in some sense god appointed a necessary result of the human constitution there is scarcely a human being that is not varied and swerved by it as the trembling needle is swerved by the approaching magnet oppose conflict with it as one may at a distance yet when it breathes on us through the breath and shines on us through the eye of an associate it possesses an invisible magnetic power he who is not at all conscious of such impressibility can scarce be amiable or human nevertheless one of the most important habits for the acquisition of a generous and noble character is to learn to act individually unswerved by the feelings and opinions of others it may help us to do this to reflect that the very person whose opinion we fear may be in equal dread of ours and that the person to whom we are looking for a precedent may at that very time be looking to us in short mrs a if you think that you could spend your money more like a christian than in laying it out on a fashionable party go forward and do it and twenty others whose supposed opinion you fear will be glad of your example for a precedent and mrs b if you do think it would be better for your children to observe early hours and form simple habits than to dress and dance and give and go to juvenile balls carry out your opinion in practice and many an anxious mother who is of the same opinion will quote your example as her shield and defence and for you young ladies let us pray you to reflect individuality of character maintained with womanly sweetness is an irresistible grace and adornment have some principles of taste for yourself and do not adopt every fashion of dress that is in vogue whether it suits you or not whether it is becoming or not but without a startling variation from general form let your dress show something of your own taste and opinions have some principles of right and wrong for yourself and do not do everything that every one else does because every one else does it nothing is more tedious than a circle of young ladies who have got by rote a certain set of phrases and opinions all admiring in the same terms the same things and detesting in like terms certain others with anxious solicitude each dressing thinking and acting one as much like another as is possible a genuine original opinion even though it were so heretical as to assert that jenny lind is a little lower than the angels or that shakespeare is rather dull reading would be better than such a universal dead sea of acquiescence these remarks have borne reference to the female sex principally because they are the dependent the acquiescent sex from nature and habit and position most exposed to be swayed by opinion and yet too in a certain very wide department they are the lawgivers and custom-makers of society if amid the multiplied schools whose advertisements now throng our papers purporting to teach girls everything both ancient and modern high and low from playing on the harp and working pincushions up to civil engineering surveying and navigation there were any which could teach them to be women 
to have thoughts opinions and modes of action of their own such a school would be worth having if one half of the good purposes which are in the hearts of the ladies of our nation were only acted out without fear of anybody's opinion we should certainly be a step nearer the millennium End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america the mayflower and other miscellaneous writings chapter thirteen christmas or the good fairy oh dear christmas is coming in a fortnight and i have got to think up presents for everybody said young ellen stewart as she leaned languidly back in her chair dear me it's so tedious everybody has got everything that can be thought of oh no said her confidential adviser miss lester in a soothing tone you have means of buying everything you can fancy and when every shop and store is glittering with all manner of splendors you cannot surely be at a loss well now just listen to begin with there's mamma what can i get for her i have thought of ever so many things she has three card cases four gold thimbles two or three gold chains two writing desks of different patterns and then as to rings brooches boxes and other things i should think she might be sick of the sight of them i am sure i am said she languidly gazing on her white and jewelled fingers the view of the case seemed rather puzzling to the adviser and there was silence for a few moments when ellen yawning resumed and then there's cousins jane and mary i suppose they will be coming down on me with a whole load of presents and mrs b will send me something she did last year and then there's cousins william and tom i must get them something and i would like to do it well enough if i only knew what to get well said eleanor's aunt who had been sitting quietly rattling her knitting needles during this speech it's a pity that you had not such a subject to practice on as i was when i was a girl presents did not fly about in those days as they do now i remember when i was ten years old my father gave me a most marvellously ugly sugar dog for a christmas gift and i was perfectly delighted with it the very idea of a present was so new to us dear aunt how delighted i should be if i had any such fresh unsophisticated body to get presents for but to get and get for people that have more than they know what to do with now to add pictures books and gilding when the centre tables are loaded with them now and rings and jewels when they are a perfect drug i wish myself that i were not sick and sated and tired with having everything in the world given to me well eleanor said her aunt if you really do want unsophisticated subjects to practice on i can put you in the way of it i can show you more than one family to whom you might seem to be a very good fairy and where such gifts as you could give with all ease would seem like a magic dream why that would really be worth while aunt look over in that back alley said her aunt you see those buildings that miserable row of shanties yes well i have several acquaintances there who have never been tired of christmas gifts or gifts of any other kind i assure you you could make quite a sensation over there well who is there let us know do you remember owen that used to make your shoes yes i remember something about him well he has fallen into a consumption and cannot work any more and he and his wife and three little children live in one of the rooms how do they get along his wife takes in sewing sometimes and sometimes goes out washing poor owen i was over there yesterday he looks thin and wasted and his wife was saying that he was parched with constant fever and had very little appetite she had with great self-denial and by restricting herself almost of necessary food got him two or three oranges and the poor fellow seemed so eager after them poor fellow said eleanor involuntarily now said her aunt suppose owen's wife should get up on christmas morning and find at the door a couple of dozen of oranges 
and some of those nice white grapes, such as you had at your party last week. Don't you think it would make a sensation? Why, yes, I think very likely it might. But who else, aunt? You spoke of a great many. Well, on the lower floor there is a neat little room that is always kept perfectly trim and tidy. It belongs to a young couple who have nothing beyond the husband's day wages to live on. They are, nevertheless, as cheerful and chipper as a couple of wrens, and she is up and down half a dozen times a day to help poor Mrs. Owen. She has a baby of her own, about five months old, and of course does all the cooking, washing, and ironing for herself and husband. And yet, when Mrs. Owen goes out to wash, she takes her baby and keeps it whole days for her. I'm sure she deserves that the good fairies should smile on her, said Eleanor. One baby exhausts my stock of virtues very rapidly. But you ought to see her baby, said Aunt E, so plump, so rosy, and good-natured, and always clean as a lily. This baby is a sort of household shrine. Nothing is too sacred or too good for it. And I believe the little thrifty woman feels only one temptation to be extravagant and that is to get some ornaments to adorn this little divinity. Why, did she ever tell you so? No, but one day, when I was coming downstairs, the door of their room was partly open, and I saw a peddler there with open box. John, the husband, was standing with a little purple cap on his hand, which he was regarding with mystified, admiring air, as if he didn't quite comprehend it, and trim little Mary gazing at it with longing eyes. I think we might get it, said John. Oh, no, said she regretfully. Yet I wish we could. It's so pretty. Say no more, aunt. I see the good fairy must pop a cap into the window on Christmas morning. Indeed, it shall be done. How they will wonder where it came from and talk about it for months to come. Well, then, continued her aunt, in the next street to ours, there is a miserable building that looks as if it were just going to topple over. And away up in the third story, in a little room just under the eaves, live two poor, lonely old women. They are both nearly on two ninety. I was in their day before yesterday. One of them is constantly confined to her bed with rheumatism. The other, weak and feeble, with failing sight and trembling hands, totters about, her only helper, and they are entirely dependent on charity. Can't they do anything? can't they knit said eleanor you are young and strong eleanor and have quick eyes and nimble fingers how long will it take you to knit a pair of stockings i said eleanor what an idea i never tried but i think i could get a pair done in a week perhaps and if somebody gave you twenty-five cents for them and out of this you had to get food and pay room rent and buy coal for your fire and oil for your lamp stop aunt for pity's sake well i will stop but they can't they must pay so much every month for that miserable shell they live in or be turned into the street the meal and flour that some kind person sends goes off for them just as it does for others and they must get more or starve and coal is now scarce and high priced oh aunt i'm quite convinced i'm sure don't run me down and annihilate me with all these terrible realities what shall I do to play good fairy to these poor old women? If you will give me full power, Eleanor, I will put up a basket to be sent to them that will give them something to remember all winter. Oh, certainly I will. Let me see if I can't think of something myself. Well, Eleanor, suppose then, some fifty or sixty years hence, if you are old, and your father and mother and aunts and uncles, now so thick around you, lay cold and silent in so many graves. You have somehow got away off to a strange city where you were never known. You live in a miserable garret where snow blows at night through the cracks, and the fire is very apt to go out in the old crack stove. You sit crouching over the dying embers the evening before Christmas. Nobody to speak to you, nobody to care for you, except another poor old soul who lies moaning in the bed. Now what would you like to have sent to you? Oh, aunt, what a dismal picture! And yet, Ella, all poor, forsaken old women are made of young girls who expected in their youth as little as you do, perhaps. Say no more, aunt. I'll buy, let me see, a comfortable, warm shawl for each of these poor women, and I'll send them. Let me see, oh, some tea. Nothing goes down with old women like tea. 
and i'll make john wheel some coal over to them and aunt it would not be a very bad thought to send them a new stove i remember the other day when mamma was pricing stoves i saw some nice ones for two or three dollars for a new aunt ella you work up the idea very well said her aunt but how much ought i to give for any one case to these women say how much did you give last year for any single christmas present why six or seven dollars for some those elegant souvenirs were seven dollars that ring i gave mrs b was twenty and do you suppose mrs b was any happier for it no really i don't think she cared much about it but i had to give her something because she had sent me something the year before and i did not want to send a paltry present to one in her circumstances then ella give the same to any poor distressed suffering creature who really needs it and see in how many forms of good such a sum will appear that one hard cold glittering ring that now cheers nobody and means nothing that you might give because you must and she takes because she must might if broken up into smaller sums send real warm and heartfelt gladness through many a cold and cheerless dwelling through many an aching heart you are getting to be an orator aunt but don't you approve of christmas presents among friends and equals yes indeed said her aunt fondly stroking her head i have had some christmas presents that did me a world of good a little bookmark for instance that a certain niece of mine worked for me with wonderful secrecy three years ago when she was not a young lady with a purse full of money that bookmark was a true christmas present and my young couple across the way are plotting a profound surprise to each other on christmas morning john has contrived by an hour of extra work every night to lay by enough to get mary a new calico dress and she poor soul has bargained away the only thing in the jewelry line she ever possessed to be laid out on a new hat for him i know too a washerwoman who has a poor lame boy a patient gentle little fellow who has lain quietly for weeks and months in his little crib and his mother is going to give him a splendid christmas present what is it pray a whole orange don't laugh she will pay ten whole cents for it for it shall be none of your common oranges but it picked one of the very best going she has put by the money a cent at a time for a whole month and nobody knows which will be happiest in it willie or his mother these are such christmas presents as i like to think of gifts coming from love and tending to produce love these are the appropriate gifts of the day but don't you think that it's right for those who have money to give expensive presents supposing always as you say they are given from real affection sometimes undoubtedly the saviour did not condemn her who broke an alabaster box of ointment very precious simply as a proof of love even although the suggestion was made this might have been sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor i have thought he would regard with sympathy the fond efforts which human love sometimes make to express itself by gifts the rarest and most costly how i rejoice with all my heart when charles elton gave his poor mother that splendid chinese shawl and gold watch because i knew they came from the very fullness of his heart to a mother that he could not do too much for a mother that has done and suffered everything for him in some cases when resources are ample a costly gift seems to have a graceful appropriateness but i cannot approve of it if it exhausts all the means of doing for the poor it is better then to give a simple offering and to do something for those who really need it eleanor looked thoughtful her aunt laid down her knitting and said in a tone of gentle seriousness whose birth does christmas commemorate ella our saviour certainly aunt yes said her aunt and when and how was he born in a stable laid in a manger thus born that in all ages he might be known as the brother and friend of the poor and surely it seems but appropriate to commemorate his birthday by an especial remembrance of the lowly the poor the outcast and distressed and if christ should come back to our city on a christmas day where should we think it most appropriate to his character to find him would he be carrying splendid gifts to splendid dwellings or would he be gliding about in the cheerless haunts of the desolate the poor the forsaken and the sorrowful and here the conversation ended what sort of christmas presents is ella buying said cousin tom as the waiter handed in a portentous-looking package 
which had been just rung in at the door let's open it said saucy will upon my word two great gray blanket shawls these must be for you and me tom and what's this a great bolt of cotton flannel and gray yarn stockings the doorbell rang again and the waiter brought in another bulky parcel and deposited it in on the marble topped table what's here said will cutting the cord who a perfect nest of packages oolong tea oranges grapes white sugar bless me ella must be going to housekeeping or going crazy said tom and on my word said he looking out of the window there's a drayman ringing at our door with a stove with a tea kettle set in the top of it ella's cook stove of course said will and just at this moment the young lady entered with her purse hanging gracefully over her hand now boys you are too bad she exclaimed as each of the mischievous youngsters were gravely marching up and down attired in a gray shawl didn't you get them for us we thought you did said both ella i want some of that cotton flannel to make me a pair of pantaloons said tom i say ella said will when are you going to housekeeping your cooking stove is standing down in the street pon my word john is loading some coal on the dray with it ella isn't that going to be sent to my office said tom do you know i do so languish for a new stove with a tea kettle in the top to heat a fellow shaving water just then another rang at the door and the grinning waiter handed in a small brown paper parcel for miss ella tom made a dive at it and staving off the brown paper developed a jaunty little purple velvet cap with silver tassels my smoking cap as i live said he only i shall have to wear it on my thumb instead of on my head too small entirely said he shaking his head gravely come you saucy boys said aunt e entering briskly what are you teasing ella for why do you see this lot of things aunt what in the world is ella going to do with them oh i know you know then i can guess aunt it is some of your charitable works you are going to make a juvenile lady bountiful of l eh ella who had colored to the roots of her hair at the expose of her very unfashionable christmas preparations now took heart and bestowed a very gentle and salutary little cuff on the saucy head that still wore the purple cap and then hastened to gather up her various purchases laugh away said she gaily and a good many others will laugh too over these things i got them to make people laugh people that are not in the habit of laughing well well i see into it said will and i tell you that i think well of the idea too there are worlds of money wasted at this time of the year in getting things that nobody wants and nobody cares for after they are got and i'm glad for my part that you are going to get up a variety in this line in fact i should like to give you one of these stray leaves to help on said he dropping a ten-dollar note into her paper i like to encourage girls to think of something besides breastpins and sugar candy but our story spins on too long if anybody wants to see the results of ella's first attempts at good fairyism they can call at the doors of two or three old buildings on christmas morning and they shall hear all about it end of chapter thirteen christmas or the good fairy <laughs>